It's a word. It is a good word. It's a wonderful, it just has a good mouthfeel. Moving Wisconsin forward one joke at a time, this is Kristen Bry with As Goes Wisconsin. Yada, yada, yada. Wisconsin! Hello, Wisconsin. Welcome to the noon lunch hour of As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Madnair. And in this first half hour, we are going to talk about funding for higher education with both our two-year schools and our four-year universities. How do they fare? How are they doing? How's enrollment looking? And here to help walk us through it, is Mark Summerhauser, who is the Communications Director and Policy Researcher for Wisconsin Policy Forum. Welcome back, Mark. Always good to be with you, Kristen. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so this report came out end of last month? Yeah, that's correct. So the, the report's higher education funding stabilizes overall, but enrollment still falling. But I think the, a lot of the headlines that came out of this was the tale, the two stories Basically, yeah. that that look like when it comes to funding education in Wisconsin, when it comes to two year universities, we're pretty good comparative to other states for year four year universities. Not so much. And so uh, before we get to that, though, I guess, why is it important to look, why study this at all? Why look into how we're funding and how much we're funding compared to other states our higher education? Yeah, sure thing. Well, you know, obviously, I think higher education is really kind of that final step in the process of creating and educating the, you know, the workers, the citizens, the leaders of tomorrow in Wisconsin. Um, you know, certainly funding more money doesn't always equal a better product, but um, there's clearly a correlation there. Um, I think, you know, our report looks at the two main forms of funding. Uh, combined that really pay the vast majority of the cost of instruction, kind of setting aside stuff like research that happens at some of the biggest universities like UW Madison that is largely funded by federal dollars. Um, the actual instruction and education of students in classrooms is mostly funded just from two main sources. The first being, of course, student tuition, and then the other piece being um, state appropriations. And so it's those two pieces that we're kind of looking at combined. Um, in our report, um, I, I think the other, just the one other thing that I would add to your que question, Kristen, is that I, I think there's a lot of reason to believe that higher education historically has been somewhat of a competitive advantage for us here mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. We're, uh, you know, a medium-sized cold weather state that for, yeah. you know, doesn't attract a lot of in-migration or, or people moving here from other states. But in the past, one mechanism that we have had to attract in-migration has been you know, an above average system of colleges and universities that have been a big attraction for people to come here and, and go to um, go to college mm -hmm. and, you know, in some cases stay here. So I think that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, I think that's something to think about in terms of why it's beneficial to hopefully retain the kind of historic edge that we've had here in Wisconsin around higher education. I'll never forget because I spent my senior year of high school at Santa Monica High School in L.A. Okay. And I remember getting there and people, you know, other students would find out that I was from Wisconsin. I was from Madison. And they're like, oh, I visited there this summer. Like, it's on my short list of, like, places I'm going to, I'm applying to. And I was like, well, did you go in the winter? Like, California <laughs> kid? Like, do you know what you're getting yourself into? But it's like, for coast, coastal kids, there's a huge draw yes. of how many kids from the coast go to Wisconsin. Um, and so that is a, that's a really good point as far as a, a driver of outside people not from Wisconsin coming to the state. Yep, absolutely. And obviously, you know, a lot of, um, you know, college students who are coming, particularly to UW know, Madison from the coast, might go here for school and return back to the coast. But like some share of people, whether they're from uh, Illinois, Minnesota, or from the coast, or wherever else are, are going to put down roots and at least work here for a period of time, which is, which is pretty beneficial to our state. Absolutely. So I guess, going back to the setup, as far as what was found in funding for two-year schools versus four-year schools is pretty different. So what was very found different. there? Yeah. So I'll just give the very big picture right off, which is that 
you know, after trailing the national average for about five years, for five years, uh, funding per student at public colleges and universities in Wisconsin did uh, overtake it, move slightly above the national average in 2021, which is the most recent year for which we had data that we looked at in this mm -hmm. report. Um, but <laughs> that's everything combined, all colleges, all universities. As you noted, there's a really significant difference when you break that down of the two-year campuses versus the four-year campuses here in Wisconsin and how their funding levels compare to their national peers. So mm -hmm. two-year public colleges here in Wisconsin, which is pre pre predominantly just the Wisconsin technical college system campuses, uh, they, uh, looking at uh, funding on a per pupil basis, uh, they received uh, just a little over 17000 about $17,153 per pupil. And again, that's state appropriations and tuition funds combined. Okay. So that, that was fifth highest in the nation. That was well above the U.S. average of yeah. $11,714 per pupil. Okay, now four-year campuses. And essentially here we are looking at the University of Wisconsin system here when we're system, talking about yeah. four-year campuses. So all 13 of the, of the uh, campuses. That was uh, fifth, just a little over 15,000, about 15,079 per pupil. So that ranked 43rd nationally. And that was, um, you know, well below the U.S. average per pupil average of funding, which was $17,733 per pupil for four year campuses nationally. So when you say it's added, tuition is added to that, does that mean the state, so if some of it is what students are paying, but like, so in raw dollars of the money the state is giving per pupil, is it more per per, per pupil at two year schools than four year schools? Yeah, I, I'm not certain about that because the one other variable that complicates this picture a little bit with the two year campuses, with the technical college campuses, is that they can do something that the four-year campuses cannot. They actually have a property tax levy that they can mm. collect from people okay. within the technical college district. So that's the one other component with the two-year campuses that, you know, I know you had mentioned kind of the difficulty of comparing the two and four-year campuses. And, and there are many reasons. Question. Yeah. Yeah. And there are many reasons for that. One of which is that the technical college uh, campuses have this funding source that the four years do not. Uh, and then we can talk about some of the other reasons as well, but it's just difficult. It's, it's, it is kind of apples and oranges, as you mentioned, and trying to compare yeah. to. We're talking to Mark Summerhauser, who is the communications director and a policy researcher for the Wisconsin Policy Forum about one of his newest reports, uh, looking into how we're, how we're funding our higher education, both two-year and four-year schools and how that ranks nationally. And, and it's interesting because I don't know what can you, what do you think we can talk a little bit more about why the the apples and oranges nature of two years versus four years schools, but is there also anything to take away from it? Is there anything to like, is it in like, does it tell us something about where the legislature has been in the past of what they want to fund versus what they don't want to fund? Like, is there anything substantial? That's a good question. You know what I mean? Yeah. So real quick, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the differences and why we you know, sort of purposefully did structure our report to hopefully not encourage our readers to compare the two, but rather to compare like the two-year campuses here to the two-year campuses nationally, the four Got years it. here to the four years nationally, because it is just, uh, it, the students have a different profile at the four-year campuses. You're yeah. going to have a lot more full-time students, more part-time students at the two-year campuses. Um, you're going to have different socioeconomic backgrounds that students are hailing from. In addition, at the two-year campuses, uh, you're going to have many more courses that are, uh, you know, uh, oriented around technical and vocational mm -hmm. education, which are going to bring with them additional, especially capital, especially like capital expenses due to uh, technical and vocational education. It will have facilities, machinery, technology that can be quite expensive. Um, that is, you know, just a different uh, setting than a lecture hall, right, at a four-year university. Um, so we, we definitely don't want to encourage people to compare the two in that way, but we do think there is something that can be gleaned from saying, okay, you know, let's compare the two years here to their peers nationally and likewise with the four years. That makes sense. Um, so what have been the trends? So it's, I guess, looking just either taking them both separately or together, the trends is we're 
back on track because a little while ago we were way below, below average and we've kind of caught up a little bit, right, as far as how much per people we're spending? Correct. Yes, that's correct. So, And I was looking for this broken down by two and four-year campuses, and I didn't unfortunately have that data you know, at, at my fingertips here. But just looking at all of them combined, the two and four-year campuses combined, that's right, um, essentially what you just said, that we were I mean, if you go back a little further, and we have a figure in our report that kind of breaks this all down over basically the last two decades. Um, Wisconsin, for certainly most of the 20 aughts, uh, all of the 20 aughts, uh, was above average in uh, per, per pupil, per student, uh, you know, funding for uh, higher ed. Uh, we did dip below uh, that national average around 2015, 2016. Uh, and then just here in 21, went back to being slightly above that national average. So, um, you know, we're, we're a little closer, I guess, to where we were maybe 10, 15 years ago uh, in that respect. Now, some of that is going to be linked to enrollment uh, in the sense that we've seen, we have seen enrollment declines here in Wisconsin. So um, that is going to mean uh, less tuition revenue in some cases, but it is can also mean that the state dollars go a bit further if they're not stretched over as many students that you're having to educate. So there's always kind of an interplay with enrollment there that can be a little bit complicated in terms of how that plays out. But because if you're looking at 2021 numbers, what budget would be that be included in? That would be, I think, the the 1921 <laughs> budget, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, that so it was be... on the tail, it was basically the tail end of what that budget right. was. We don't right. have data for this, the current budget we're living under. Correct. And obviously the next budget is not done yet. Right. <laughs> so, you know, these two year cycles. And so, uh, all right, well, when we come back, I, yes, exactly. <laughs> when we come back, I do want to talk about enrollment and the place, the piece that plays, because at least what I've been seeing, enrollment is down, especially comparatively nationally in Wisconsin. Yes. And what does that tell us and what ramifications does that have? Um, and also maybe touch on what the UW branch campus is, because there's a, been a lot of headlines about them and where do they fit in the two-year versus four-year conversation. So lots to talk about when we come back. We are talking to Mark Summerhauser, who's the communications director and policy researcher for Wisconsin Policy Forum. Stay tuned. Real Chili's been serving up mouth-watering goodness to the people of Milwaukee since 1931. Their famous secret award-winning chili recipe is the same as it was back then and a local treasure. From lunch to dinner to late-night breakfast, Real Chili has you covered. And now you can bring the Real Chili to your next party, tailgate, wedding, or office gathering with their unbeatable catering options. And don't forget about their Real Love Party Packs, perfect for small groups, and pick up from their two convenient locations, downtown Milwaukee and near Marquette University campus. Visit them at realchili.com. That's realchili.com. It's time to have some fun and make a difference, Waukesha County. Attend the 2023 Habitat for Humanity of Waukesha Dream Builders Gala on June 9th at 6 p.m. in the Dominica Park neighborhood. Help celebrate the accomplishments of last year while helping to create, preserve, and promote affordable housing in our area. Enjoy an upscale barbecue, live entertainment, and the chance to make a real difference in the lives of local families. Register now at HabitatWaukesha.org forward slash events. That's HabitatWaukesha.org forward slash events. Let's build a brighter future together. This is Pat Brightlow from Up North News Radio. On the air, online, or on demand, make it a point to catch the first word on Wisconsin news, sports, and more weekday mornings from 6 to 8 all across the stations of the Civic Media Radio Network. Fear you may be missing out? We're always streaming on TuneIn and the Civic Media app. Enjoy listening live or catch up by finding the podcast at civicmedia.us or wherever you enjoy listening to your podcasts. Here's your updated forecast on the Shaw. 75 this afternoon, under mainly sunny skies, winds out of the south, 5 to 10 miles an hour. Mainly clear skies and quiet again tonight, 51. Mainly clear tomorrow, daytime highs approaching 77. Turning cooler Friday and Saturday with a chance for scattered rain showers, highs in the upper 60s. For Civic Media, I'm meteorologist Derek Height. Currently, it's 70 degrees. The Shaw 101 FM, your fix for progressive talk from Big Bend to Menominee Falls. Always streaming at WAUKradio.com.
Cause you know I'm all about the data, about the data, more data. I'm all about the data, more data. I'm all about the data, more data. I'm all about the data, more data. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Madnair, and we are talking to Mark Summerhauser, who is the communications director and policy researcher for Wisconsin Policy Forum about funding, higher education, and how it's looking in Wisconsin. Um, but yeah, enrollment is declining. Uh, and I anecdotally, I've talked to some young people who are like, I have my I have a small business, or I have this or that, or the trades, and like the the promise of it being worth it sounds like there's less people who are convinced that it's true but Some i also feel like thinking it yeah yeah sure. and um so what have you found like when you actually look at the data and not just stories as far as where what our enrollment looks like yeah so um there's no question that it's it's declining and there's a national trend that's happening of declining higher ed enrollment uh, but it is a little more pronounced here in Wisconsin. And to some extent, that does appear to be kind of a regional phenomenon rather than a Wisconsin specific one. We're kind of seeing that throughout the Midwest. Um, but, you know, the big picture is you had this kind of uh, the millennial generation, that sort of demographic bubble, more young people choosing to go to college. We kind of hit a high point during the Great Recession, actually, around 2010, 2011 where many, many higher ed institutions saw record enrollment levels. And that's where we kind of peaked in terms of total higher ed enrollment here in Wisconsin was 20, yeah, 2010 was our peak year. Since that time, our higher ed enrollment has been on a sort of slow decline here in Wisconsin, again, sort of mirroring what is happening in most other places. But we did see that accelerate specifically just during the last three years during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Again, there is a national trend that we're sort of following there, but we're a little more pronounced than what you see nationally. But then also, and we can talk a little bit about this, that top line number obscures some really big differences between different types of campuses. We're seeing a much bigger enrollment decline at the two-year campuses than the four-year. Oh, interesting. And then even so if, yeah. So it's okay. worse. I mean, it's it's more of a decline at two years. I would have thought Correct. it would be opposite. Me too. Correct. It's it's uh, more pronounced here. Let me see if I can get you the exact. Yeah. So the the UW system enrollment. Uh, let's just take the pandemic here. The last three years, it declined five point three percent. Technical college system in the last three years, enrollment was down ten point three percent. So, wow. um, you know, could be that some of those young people who might have considered technical college. Um, with an extremely tight labor market right now, uh, a lot of opportunities, a lot of job openings. Yeah. There are there are opportunities for people out there to to get jobs, you know, without necessarily having to go through the process of getting, um, you know, getting a, a technical co college education. So that could certainly be part of what's influencing that. A big part of it is just demographics. Um, the high school classes, the graduating high school classes, are just smaller now than they were yeah. in 2010. And so that's absolutely, you know, playing into it. Um, and so, but the interesting thing too, uh, is that even if you just set aside the two year and you only look at the four year campuses, um, huge differences in the enrollment trends, um, UW Madison just over the last three years gained 10% in enrollment. So mm -hmm. it's on a trajectory of continuing to get bigger, continuing to see more and more students. But then as you look around the state, um, the only other UW, UW system campus that increased in enrollment here over the last three years was UW Green Bay. The others declined and some declined quite, quite markedly. So, you know, we can look at places like UW Milwaukee, Whitewater, Eau Claire, Oshkosh, um, UW Parkside, Platteville, all we're seeing double digit percentage declines in enrollment. So wow. once again, it's like you can look at these top line numbers, but then when you look beneath, there's there's really different dynamics at play there depending on what what type of university or college. Well, and that doesn't even get into what's, I think, made headlines a lot this year, which is all the the two-year UW branch campuses with Platteville closing without a lot of um, uh, notice, <laughs> if you want to put right. it that way. At Richland, and, at Richland Center, yeah. Yeah, right. at Richland Center. Yeah. And, um, and, and then also just conversations of 
other campuses and should they combine? Should they close? Because, you know, is there is there an argument here that we, we have if enrollment is declining, some dollars are getting stretched thin for four year universities that we don't need as many higher education like options as we have right now between the Wisconsin Technical College System and the UW system. And I don't want to put you in the spot to make it a choice there, but is that a fair? I, I will definitely not be offering my hot takes on how many <laughs> campuses we need in Wisconsin, but because that is the absolute, you know, third rail of any of these conversations, right? Is like anytime you even bring up that that topic, there there are understandably a lot of institutions that are very defensive. Totally. And, and worry about how that impacts their future. Um there is no question that particularly at some of these two year, what, what was the former UW colleges, they were merged with the four year campuses back in 2017 when the regents took a vote to merge all the UW colleges into the larger system. And essentially now each of the four year universities has like one or two of those former UW colleges that are like paired up with them. Um, and there's no question that they have seen the biggest decline in enrollment. Um, just since 2019, enrollment at those two-year um, former UW colleges campuses dropped by 32%. So Wow. Yeah. And so there is certainly a question about kind of what their future looks like. And once again, you can't think about it just from a statewide perspective because some have seen even bigger enrollment declines. Some are doing coming closer to holding steady. But, you know, I know, for instance, you mentioned Richland, UW Richland. There is a discussion over in suburban Milwaukee and Washington County about possibly merging mm -hmm. a UW college there with a local technical college, I believe, in Washington County. Um, and I, again, I don't know if that decision has been yeah. made, but I just know there's conversations that have been publicly happening around that. So that is definitely one of the biggest question marks is kind of where, where those – uh, branch campus. I was going to go sort of fit in the bigger. I have to cut you off because we have to go to a break. Yep. Never enough time. But Mark Summerhauser, communications director and policy researcher for Wisconsin Policy Forum. Uh, I will link this to our show notes for today. Super interesting. And it'll be super interesting to see where we get where we go in this year's budget. So thanks so much for your time. Agreed. Thank you, Kristen. All right. WAUK 540 AM. Franklin's Choice for News Talk Radio. Streaming 24-7 at WAUKradio.com. CBS News Brief. A member of Congress arrested today on federal criminal charges. It's New York Republican George Santos, who admitted lying about his past. He now faces a host of charges that include wire fraud and money laundering. Legal analyst Jessica Levinson. This goes to the heart of his ability to be a public servant. Homeland Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas vows a tighter southern border in the days ahead. The lifting of the Title 42 public health order does not mean our border is open. In fact, it is the contrary. Hi, Chris. Hey, hi. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. I'm glad you didn't drive an hour and 45 minutes to get here. It, as much as I would have loved to see you in person, that is a lot for less than a half hour. Well, I really wanted to because I just thought it would be fun. And at the time, it seemed like a good idea. But you know how. You know, there's a better <laughs> ways to spend a beautiful, beautiful day than oh. than driving here and back. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks so much for inviting me on. This is great. Yeah, this is going to be super fun. So we'll come back and... First, let's just talk about the program, who's involved in the program, how many different women it's reached. Uh, we can talk about the like the, what are the activities and the learning circles and all of that. We can talk about the events. So I'm 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 sure we'll have plenty to talk about. But um, the first break is at twelve forty eight, so okay. we have a good chunk of time to uh, to get into it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, all right, looking forward. Perfect. So we have uh, like two or three more minutes, and then we'll come back, and you'll be able to see us. Okay, thanks. Is the sound good? Am I close enough? Sounds Almost. good. You look good. All right. Awesome. Okay. School bus crash Friday. Four teenagers have been picked up so far, and police were still looking for one more person early this morning. One of the kids in the stolen Kia was badly injured. A child on the bus who was hurt should be okay. In sports, the Dodgers beat the Brewers last night 6-2. The rubber match of the series is today. I'm Terry Bell, and this is Civic Media News.
High pay with excellent benefits? Check. Fair treatment and safe work conditions? Check. A paid training program? Check. Check all of your career boxes with the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades of District Council 7. Experienced industrial painters and drywall finishers needed now or become an apprentice. Call Tom Coyne at 262-488-4839 today. 262-488-4839 or go to IUPATDC7.com. Are record high energy and water costs putting a squeeze on your fixed or limited incomes? With inflation rising at record levels and incomes not keeping pace, you might be one of tens of thousands of Wisconsin residents who are struggling to survive. While you may not ask for it, the Keep Wisconsin Warm Cool Fund and your local energy assistance providers are here to help. No Wisconsin resident should ever have to be without heat, water, or power. For a hand up, apply today and call 1-800-506-5596. That's 800-506-5596. Or visit www.heat.help. That's www.heat. That help. Up North News Radio is Wisconsin's new choice for progressive talk about important state issues from the team that brings you the news through social media, newsletters, and here on the radio. I'm Pat Kreitlow. Join me weekday mornings from 6 to 8 a.m. Oh, can you take care of her? Oh, maybe you can spare her several moments of your consideration leading up to the final destination. Oh, the earth is... Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Matnair. And uh, I'm so excited to talk about this. I think, Jane, you found this at first, and then I saw it in the Journal Sentinel. But there is a organization in Wisconsin that is helping women landowners connect and learn about conservation practices and resources and funding opportunities. And it sounds like even though I don't really own any land and I don't know how to do take anything care of anything, <laughs> including most of my plants, um, something that sounds really fun to be a part of. So here to talk help, help us talk about it is Chris Marion, who's the communications specialist with Wisconsin Women in Conservation. Welcome to the show, Chris. It's so great to be with you guys. I'm a little intimidated because I'm a big fan, Chris. Oh, no, there's nothing to be intimidated <laughs> easy, about. Easy peasy. I, I feel no pressure to be feel pressure to be funny, and that's not going to happen. I'm sure. I, I'm sure you have a good, great sense of humor, and that's all you require is just a willingness to play. <laughs> oh, I know so, how to play. So perfect. So, so tell us for people who are unfamiliar, what is Wisconsin Women in Conservation? Well, thanks so much for asking. First of all, we should maybe start with what conservation is. That is um, a great starting point. Yeah, I think that people sometimes associate conservation with hunting. You know, a lot of our conservation programs have to do with preserving public lands, hunting lands. Um, but conservation, uh, by definition, right, is just when you're saving or protecting something. Mm -hmm. And so conservation in our context is saving land, saving soil, saving and protecting water. So we kind of fall under the uh, uh, sort of the big ag umbrella of taking care of soil, water and wildlife. So that's kind of the foundation of what we're all about. Um, and we're a, a five year project that is a collaboration between four different agricultural nonprofits, Wisconsin Farmers Union, Renewing the Countryside, which is sort of out of the uh, Minneapolis, Eau Claire area. Uh, Michael Fields Agricultural Institute, kind of East Troy area. And then finally, um, let's see, we did Farmers Union, Renewing the Countryside. Uh, Marble Seed. Marble Seed is the final group. It used to be Moses, which was uh, the largest organic and sustainable uh, nonprofit. In the nation so we've got a powerful group of agricultural um nonprofits that are actually funded by the natural resources conservation service nrcs which is a usda united states department of agriculture uh program and we're funded by them 
to help women landowners, farmers, farm curious, um, navigate all of these acronyms. <laughs> yes, there are a lot. You've been reading about it. I was like, oh, this is a lot of things to keep track of. I'm glad you, Chris can explain of, it. I'm not going to try to. <laughs> it's alphabet soup. It's like driving on country roads, right? In Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's it's complicated and it's confusing. And the truth is women are a growing force on the land, but many women didn't grow up being in charge of the land mm -hmm. decisions. Um, they didn't grow up uh, going into that uh, USDA office that's in every county. And so uh, at, at a really basic level, our goal is to get women who are controlling land, stewarding land, to get through that USDA doorway. <laughs> and like literally, we want people to go visit the office. Um, and then our end goal is to get conservation on the land, to get more yeah. good conservation practices on the land. So everything we do is is women only. Uh, with very few exceptions. Um, we put people in touch with conservation experts, so professionals in the field who are also all women. And then we're all encouraging each other through kind of a peer support model to do better and do more and take advantage of those cost share programs that come through the federal government when they're available. So we do have some money and lots of help, a ton of enthusiasm, and um, a lot of snacks. <laughs> a lot of snacks. Is it a, is it a lot of homegrown snacks? Is it people bringing their own food that they grew, or is it like Trader Joe's? Oh no, no Trader Joe's. So no not, Trader Joe's. I don't love a Trader Joe's snack, but we are super committed to local food, to nice. local economies, and so yeah, when you come to an event, you will be eating local food, and probably. Uh, you might even have some local cocktails. <laughs> nice. We are uh, Esco's Wisconsin. Chris is very pro both of those. Both things. of those things. Both of those things. <laughs> and so it's when I was looking at the website in Wisconsin alone, there's almost forty thousand female producers. Mm -hmm. That blew me away. And and thirty five percent of all the producers in the state are women. Yeah, so it's really, this is in some ways new and uncharted territory that we're, we're kind of playing catch up to some things that have been realities and th some things that are new. So the reality is women have always been farming, totally women have always been half of the equation <clears throat> and women own half of the farmland. They either own or co-own, right? They're, mm -hmm. But it used to be that women couldn't own land. Now they weren't forbidden from doing it, but it was much more common for, for guys to be on those leases. What's more up until the seventies, women couldn't get credit. Yeah. There's that. <laughs> if, you, if you know anything about farming, you know that there's a lot of credit yeah. involved in the, you know, you acquiring land, acquiring equipment. Um, and so this is an attempt. There's a big attempt by the USDA at this point to, um, make up for historical harms done to women and to minorities and to generally underserved populations. And there's, it's a big issue, but women in particular are now really rising in power in terms of controlling the landscape. Um, you mentioned that 35% num number, 35% of the producers. So that's ag producers in Wisconsin now self-identify as women. That being the, the being the primary uh, primary decision maker on the farm. That's a lot. That's a that's lot. A, that's a big difference. And what's interesting about this demographic is um, a high percentage of that thirty five percent are first time, first generation, and new and beginning farmers. So getting good conservation information in the hands of these producers is. Uh, really, really, really significant. The other part of this is women tend to live longer and there's mm -hmm. a lot of widows who have come into control of farmland um, and who are now having to manage leases and the, mm -hmm. and the care of that property where they didn't before. So that's another big target audience for us. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a wild ride. These, these, our events are Full of people of all ages. We've got dairy people. We've got prairie stewards. 
Um, one of the people we're seeing a lot of, the groups we're seeing a lot of now are women who have bought property in the country because they love um, being in the countryside. And now they want to do something really good with the, with the land they have. They want to help save the world and they want to do it by uh, learning how to take care of their forests, learning how to put prairies in, learning how to take care of their streams and rivers. And these are, in this day and age, in the middle of this climate crisis, this is really important work and women realize it. So it, it's a, this is a hugely mission driven crowd. It, these are very earnest people. We might be eating and drinking, but we are very serious about what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking to Chris Marion, who is a communication specialist for Wisconsin Women in Conservation. And I guess, so tell me about these learning circles, because it sounds like they are long and they're <laughs> intimate. And there's a lot of conversations. It's, it's it's what women do best, right? Like we we do like to talk. And so like what what is like describe or draw the picture of what one of the learning uh the learning circles looks and sounds like. Yeah, this is so fun. This was really something that got highlighted in the Journal Sentinel article because mm -hmm. the reporter tagged along, came to a learning circle and did a lot of work interviewing our um kind of the history behind this project. There are two women researchers who are on our team, who've been researching the way women learn for over a decade. And our model is based on their research. And so their research indicates, this is Jean Eels and Rebecca Christoffel, um, both uh, the, the doctors. We have a lot of doctors on our team, actually, but there are two of them. Uh, and they have found that women want to have more interaction. So women don't want to go to a, a class that happens to be on a farm that's about agronomy. They want to sit in a discussion and have a back and forth dialogue about what does this mean? What does soil health mean? What does microbial life mean? What, what does it feel like? What does good soil feel like? What does it smell like? Can mm -hmm. we walk around? Can we look in your barns? <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're pretty nosy, but I will say um, there's really not a farmer out there who doesn't want to get on another farmer's land. <laughs> it's, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> it's always fun. I mean, field days work great for men and women. And if you were to just uh, Google, say, conservation event, um, other than Earth Day things, you would end up seeing a lot of ag events on farms that have a guy up front and a bunch of guys standing listening. Um, it's very fascinating to stand on someone else's farm and peek into their operation. Like, what are you, and what I, are you doing over there? I, you, how does that work over here? I will never now be able to get this vision out of my head of people peeking in other people's barns, like a <laughs> medicine cabinet, you know, like, oh, what's in there? <laughs> oh, but, I mean, you captured the attitude perfectly. It's like, you just cannot get enough of like, oh my gosh, how are they handling weeds? Or how are they dealing with these invasive species? I did this good thing. I planted a prairie. Now my prairie's full of prickly ash. And how are other people dealing with this? You know, is there a tool? Is there, do you have a little tractor, a big tractor? But are you using a mower? Are, you know, we, we love this stuff. So this, it, our learning circles are basically a field day event turned inward. So instead of people facing forward and looking at some teacher, it's people in a circle, um, sometimes inside, like we, we had an event in the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee because we were doing these things early on um, before it was warm. Now all of our things are moving outside. Mm -hmm. We're arranged in a circle and we spend the first hour or more of our events going around the circle, telling who we are. Uh, what's our land love story? You know, what's our origin story? Why do we care about this stuff? And um, what what do we need? You know, what are our big what are our biggest concerns? And in the process of doing that, you one build a network. But you know, it's it it might take an hour and a half, but then you have this network of people. Yeah. You know their deal. You know their story. Then you you're also meeting conservation professionals. Our professionals that we invite to teach are part of the circle. So they're telling their story. Why did they get involved in this as a profession? So by the time we get done, there's been a lot of laughing. There's been a lot of kvetching <laughs> and a lot of, um, I would say, 
very affirming interactions that make you realize you are not the only one who feels confused about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the, the science on conservation is changing all the time. One of yeah. the new, it's not, it's not new, but it's sort of new in the public imagination is the idea that soil health is the basis of everything. Now, indigenous cultures have known this forever um, and have a real relationship with the land and the wildlife. But for those of us who've been involved in say production ag or just development of rural places, we just use the resource. <laughs> we use it up and you know, we do our best to take care of our animals, but taking care of the animals in the soil is a bit of a new concept. And there's a lot of great science and we are discussing that science at our learning circles and our field days, but it's not in a classroom or a, a one direction kind of format. It's very relational. So people leave learning a lot, feeling empowered, like, okay, it's a lot, but I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> And two, now I know someone down the road from me, even if it's an hour away, who I can go connect with and get help from. So we have a big mentorship. We have a formal mentorship network. Um, Perfect. So we're going to talk about more about the mentorship uh, network and the upcoming events for May and June when we come back. Our guest is Chris Marion, who's a communication specialist with Wisconsin Women in Conservation. Stay with us. This is As Goes Wisconsin. Are record high energy and water costs putting a squeeze on your fixed or limited incomes? With inflation rising at record levels and incomes not keeping pace, you might be one of tens of thousands of Wisconsin residents who are struggling to survive. While you may not ask for it, the Keep Wisconsin Warm Cool Fund and your local energy assistance providers are here to help. No Wisconsin resident should ever have to be without heat, water, or power. For a hand up, apply today and call 1-800-506-5596. That's 800-506-5596. Or visit www.heat.help. That's www.heat. That help. Missed your favorite show live on air? It's easy to find what you enjoy wherever you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts. And we're always streaming on TuneIn and the Civic Media app. Weather brought to you by Takeri Miyagi, Waukesha's authentic Mexican food truck, which is now open and ready to serve you. Find us at 1610 Lincoln Avenue in the BP gas station parking lot or call us at 262-278-6590. Here's your updated forecast on the Shaw. Temperatures reach up to 75 this afternoon under mainly clear skies. Winds out of the southeast 5 to 10 miles an hour. Mainly clear tonight, lows dip down to about 51. High temperatures reach up to 77 tomorrow, mainly sunny. Upper 60s Friday and Saturday with scattered showers possible both days. For Civic Media, I'm meteorologist Eric Height. Currently, it's 70 degrees. A progressive voice from Beaver Dam to Kenosha, WAUK 540 AM. Always streaming at WAUKradio.com. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Matnair, and we are talking to Chris Marion, who is a communication specialist for uh, women, Wisconsin Women in Conservation. And I want to make sure that we cover all of the upcoming events that you guys have going on for May and June. So it is a mouthful, isn't it? Our, <laughs> our it's fun because I feel like Wisconsin women... It's fun because it's alliteration, but uh, I think Sarah Godlewski has Wisconsin women win or something like that. It's sometimes it's a little bit of a mouthful where you're like, that's a lot of W's. Okay, go. Chris, how do you, how do you feel about WeeWick? 
Yes, that is what our that's what we call okay. ourselves. <laughs> so WeWick is what we generally call ourselves, and that's our website. So it would be great if you went and poked around over there, wiwic.org. We've got podcast on there. You can hear Wisconsin women conservationists talk about their passion for land and the earth. Um, and you can see all of our events. And we also have lots of webinars that are archived on our blog. So you can learn a lot just poking around. Nice. And then so as far as things coming up, because you guys, this is across the state, right? It's not just one, one part. Yeah. So we're basically trying to really pull people together in tri-county regional networks. And we're very active in five, um, actually six areas right now. And we'll expand to three or four more next year for the next two years. But um, people can come wherever. If you want to get in the car and drive to something that looks interesting in a county that's a couple hours away from you, you should do it. And we've got two events this week um, on Thursday and Friday. Uh, they're both the our learning circles, so they're not a field day. You wouldn't get a farm tour in these, but these are at great places. So one is at the Enchanted Barn in Hillsdale, which is, I think it's in Polk, might be in Polk County, but, you know, up that direction. Then we have one at Freedom Park in Prescott, which is a little bit further south, both on the western side of the state. And then we have field days on the northeastern side, or learning circles on the northeastern side of the state next week. Um, we're also starting a webinar series. It, it's our conservation summer camp. And these, these are once a month. And our first one is on the 18th. So uh, next Thursday, and it's on birds. So it's a, about conservation helpers that are animals. Um, we're going to cover birds and bugs and bats and snakes and turtles this year. <laughs> So, do you do you have any pre do you have any thoughts on people talking to birds, Chris? Oh well, actually, do you, do you encourage talking, the talking to birds? I've been talking to birds all morning. I've got an Oreo See? feeder. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not alone, Chris, because I talk to the hummingbirds when they show up, and I just usually say, "Hi, welcome back. You're safe here." Um, <laughs> you know, people like play music for their cows, so this is not this is not. That's not a weird thing. I don't judge. I just love to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Always talking to the birds. I actually have more conversation with my frogs here because I live on a wetland. But oh. when I'm in my office, it's it's the birds right there in the window. You know, it's Oriole season. So, you know, we've got jelly all over the farm right now. Jelly and oranges are just everywhere. And there have just been some disturbing statistics coming out about how many songbirds we have lost. Not just in Wisconsin, but around the country. It's it's like a billion birds. Really? I missed that. It's oh. yeah. I mean, this is over a, a stretch of time, but but and songbirds are really important to the ecosystem too. Well, if you were to look up Xerxes Society, it starts with an X, not a Z. Um, but Xerxes Society has a ton of stats on how many species we're losing yearly um, worldwide. And you know, this is the dark side of this project: is that we're in an emergency. <laughs> we're in a climate emergency. We talk about that a lot, but we're in an ecosystem failure for multiple, multiple, multiple species that add a ton to their our lives um, and that agriculture relies on. So we we talk a lot about honeybees, right? Everybody wants to see yeah. bees, but it's not just bees. There are tons of critters that we need above the ground, in the air, but also below the ground that are are perishing because of our 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 lack of good conservation practices. So I guess finally um as far as kind of the average person who's listening to this right now maybe they are a farmer maybe they have a community garden maybe they don't do anything at all but as far as for anyone who's listening what would you say they should know get involved with how well, do, how, do, how do you get involved in conservation? So Luckily, we have a great administration federally right now who is interested in getting a lot of people involved in conservation. So the United States Department of Ag has generally only really cared about producers and larger producers. But under this administration and under the Obama administration, too, there have been some great initiatives to help urban farmers, niche farmers, innovative farmers. So we can help connect you. If you just want to do a good job with a pollinator patch in your backyard, we got something for you. 
we got something for you at Wisconsin Women in Conservation. We're not just for ag producers. So, I feel like that's what I need is a pollinator patch. Kristen, that's what I, Kristen needs help. Yes, oh I, gosh, do, I definitely need help. I have like not a lot of, I don't have a big yard, but I have a yard finally for the first time in my life. And so try to figure out what to do with it. Well, everybody can participate in conservation. That's the good news. Whether it's keeping rain um, from creating runoff and taking, you know, dirt and, and pesticides and chemicals off your driveway into mm. the public sewer where it eventually, you know, pollutes our water. There's there's so much that individuals can do on every scale. And we're here for everybody. Uh, we have a Milwaukee Urban Ag Network that just started that's mostly pulling together uh, community garden folks and small scale growers that are supporting farmers markets. Um, but USDA is now putting some money where their mouth is. <laughs> so is and we can help you get some access to that. But just signing up for our webinars, they're once a month, they're an hour at lunch. You will learn a ton about how to do the best for the birds and the beetles and the snakes <laughs> and the bats. Now, not everybody wants to do their best for bats and snakes, but you should. They deserve it too. Absolutely. Yes, and they do. <laughs> Chris, when is the next field day so I can go snoop in people's barns? Oh, gosh. If you want to get nosy, June 1 starts our field days. And we will have 41 events this year. We've got oh, a wow. ton of events. So if you're up for traveling, you can come see great operations. Um, the first one is Blue Ox Farm. That's in Wheeler. And this is a grazing sheep and Highland cow operation. You know, those really cute cows with the bangs and the long <laughs> horns. So between sheep and cute cows, all cows are cute. Um, that that is going to be a really beautiful, lovely field day. Then we're having one June 23rd at Kiwadden Farms, which is over near Verwokwa in Viola. This is uh, the home of Driftless Curiosity. So this is going to be a really fun field day. CSA, birds, everything. At that awesome. Point. All right. Well, we will link all of that to our show notes today. Chris Marion, thank you so much for spending time with us. Great to be with you guys. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Well, yeah, that sounds super interesting. Add it to the bucket list, Jane. All right. Well, we're going to take a break for the top of the hour news. Uh, and when we come back, the no sour, ha ha, fun time power hour. Stay tuned. Thank you. <laughs>